All right. Good morning and thank you for joining us today for the Provost Town Hall. Uh, my name is Jason Matt. I work in the Office of the Provost and I have just a couple of quick administrative notes before we get started today. Um, first, this meeting is being recorded. In the coming days, we'll go ahead and post that recording online um, on the Office of the Provost website, along with some recap notes so that anybody who missed it or has to leave early is able to catch back up. Um, also, there's not a chat feature for this event, uh, but please note that there is a Q&A feature at the top of your screen. We received some questions in advance of the town hall and we'll have time for others during the back half of this event. So please enter your questions that you have into the Q&A. The production team is receiving those and queuing up our speakers to answer your questions as they come in. So with that, I'll turn it over to our host and leader, Provost McLaughlin. Steve, go ahead and get us going. Awesome. Um, can everybody hear me? Give me a thumbs up if you can if you can hear me. OK, awesome. Thank you, Jason. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, happy Halloween. Um, hopefully uh, it's going to be a fun um, and safe evening. Uh, for folks that are going to be doing uh, trick or treating. It's been a while since I've done that and, and, and miss it. So thanks everyone for being here. I see we have just a little over 100 attendees. Um, I'm going to slow roll a little bit to have for, at least to getting started um, to allow some more folks um, to join. So uh, going to do a bunch of different things, do some celebrations and some things to to um, to brag about. Uh, talk about the work that we're doing uh, this term um, and talk about some of the challenges uh, that that we're facing. I think everyone recognizes and this is a this is a tough time for a whole bunch of reasons and we'll, and we'll touch on that. Uh, my colleagues are here. Um, you can see we're going to we'll, uh, get some updates on a number of different fronts and um, hopefully we've got a lot to cover. So some of it will go fairly quickly um, and so hopefully we'll have some time um, to do some Q&A and some some closing thoughts. So next slide, please. So starting off with some um, some celebrations and some points of pride, uh, not just for the provost office, but for uh, the entire institution. You, you you heard probably President Cabrera during his, if you attended his um, institute address, uh, a number of these things that uh, that we celebrate. Celebrate. We're growing, um, and we know that there are some pain points um, tied to that. Uh, but we are the number one fastest growing public institution in, in America. Um, a lot of that is due to the online program, but we are growing um, the undergraduate populations for in, in, in light of being the third most selective public university and um, actually the number one university in yield where yield is we offer students um, admission um, and the percentage of students that accept our admission places us at least among publics um, as number one. We continue to have uh, very, very strong, incredibly strong applicants and or there, you know, may know that we're in the early phases of some of the early um, early action and already we're seeing 9% increase in, um, in applicants and believe it or not, we're up to about 48,000 students. You know, roughly 20,000 of those are in our online master's program, um, but the uh, online, the on campus uh, community continues, continues to grow uh, research continues to grow at kind of an astounding, astounding pace. And um, we're, no, we're number 20 in higher education on research and development, you know, in um, spending, but number one um, in the nation for the second year in a row uh, for those institutions uh, that don't have a medical school. So a lot of points of, of pride. Next slide, please. Again, some of the these are the kind of the most uh, recent rankings. Uh, you probably know some of the criteria for the US News World Report uh, was changed to focus on more student impacts and kind of social mobility um, impacts. And, and we rose um, in, in those rankings and, and some of the other ones, including ROI, which I think um, has always been a tradition for, for Georgia Tech, um, very, very high ROI. Um, for how it is our students do at a relatively uh, low low cost. Next slide. So um, one of the I, one of the things that that I hear about um, regularly when we talk to faculty, um, really talk to anyone is growth and and the pains tied to to growth and our attempts to really continue to keep up with that. Um, that growth uh, we tend to think of. As, as relatively recent, it's not. Um, I would say only in the last two or three years have we been more intentional 
um, at addressing that growth. But that growth, particularly in the undergraduate student population, really started 10, 10 years ago, but maybe not as uh, as more uh, closely addressed as we've done um, in the past. Here are just some metrics, literally just within the, in the last year, we are a net up of 80 new <clears throat> academic faculty, that's tenure track and non-tenure track uh, faculty, it represents a 5% uh, growth in, in total faculty. Um, and we will continue to, to make that kind of investment, uh, particularly as it relates to the classroom. Um, we did a number of efforts, that's the second point, around pushing money out to the, to the colleges, really focused on instruction, and struck, uh, focused on the, the particular pain points, um, uh, communicated with the deans and uh, finding uh, and doing, you know, kind of our own work on finding the, the biggest pain points and pushing uh, pushing funds um, a little bit earlier uh, this year than we've done in the past um, to try to address those. There are a couple space planning efforts. We know that uh, classroom uh, uh, scheduling continues to be a challenge, particularly as it relates to to large classrooms. Um, for um, uh, and, and things like we continue to hear for for computer science. And by the way, it's a whole other conversation. It's really a whole other hour um, today. Twenty eight percent of all Georgia Tech undergraduates are studying. Drum roll, please. Computer science. Um, and so we continue to have very, very, very strong growth in that. Um, and we're doing some things uh, real probably this year. We'll be doing some things really for the first time um, to address um, to address some of that completely separate um, topic. Capital planning, we announced and got approval for a, a new 800 bed dorm, um, renovations of existing dorms, a whole bunch of other plans that are being discussed around housing uh, challenges. We have 3000 students on wait lists um, trying to get on campus. You know that you know around campus, there is a ton of housing available through, through private um, resources, but that's more expensive. Um, and so trying to address as quickly as we can um, housing um, housing challenges. And we've also kind of restarted the Provost Advisory Committee on academic scheduling. And we are going to have to ask uh, our colleagues to be um, to be more flexible than they've been in, in the past in terms of classroom utilization. That means early classes, that means late classes. Um, but that, that committee has just been uh, reconvened. And I think you'll see is gonna, we're going to be more intentional and strategic around uh, classroom usage. Next slide, please. <coughs> The, um, I'm, a, a lot of this, these are, these are the president's goals um, that relate to academic affairs. Every year, the president has to communicate a set of goals uh, to the chancellor and is held accountable for those. Uh, there's a very, very large number of goals that he sets out every year. These are the ones just related to academic affairs. I'm not, uh, so that's really the purview of, of our office, and it's extremely well aligned with the strategic plan and the things that we do. Obviously, those plans are not uh, developed in isolation um, um, with the president. And you're going to hear uh, when my colleagues come on uh, in the provost office, you're going to hear about a bunch of them. So uh, we talked a little bit about first year and transfer uh, enrollment goals. Today, 25% of all students who get a, a Georgia Tech degree come through our transfer programs. They're extraordinarily important. They're going to be increasingly important as it relates to student diversity, as it relates to cost, as it relates to um, accessibility. You're, you're going to hear more about the quality enhancement program. You're going to hear more about lifetime learning. Um, there is a, cer certainly one of the big um, outputs, outcomes of the strategic plan was around arts and how to more infuse arts both in the academic side as well as in research. You may have heard some early rumblings about Art Square. We have Technology Square, Science Square, um, you know, on the on the western part of campus is growing. If you've seen the construction um, in Science Square, there's beginnings and more than just beginnings about a new art square in that direction. We've uh, Georgia Tech's acquired some some land um, and plans are developing to to really um, uh, develop the arts more fully on on our campus. Uh, lots and lots and lots of emphasis on limited income students. Um, one of the places where Georgia Tech is not doing well is the percentage of enrollment of Pell eligible students. And so there's an entire strategic planning group and effort um, working on um, making resources available and in increasing the number of limited income students. It's also tied very, very heavily to the capital campaign. We maybe know we announced a $2 billion capital campaign of which about four, the largest single goal 
is um, need-based aid, about $400 million in need-based aid to begin to make a dent um, in uh, making Georgia Tech more accessible uh, to families that have more limited income. Four-year graduation rates, we do very well in six-year, five-year graduation rates, very, very comparable to our peers. We're making real good progress on, on four-year rates, but that was certainly four-year graduation rates. Um, um, and it's certainly one of the president's goals. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, financial well-being um, of graduate students. It, it really is time um, for us to do a better job in the financial well-being of graduate students. You may know that nationally there is a huge movement to uh, unionize graduate students. Um, Georgia is not a collective bargaining, does not allow collective bargaining, and so unionization of um, you know of our graduate students is not going to be possible but the needs are very very much there um, and i think there are a number of things underway to to really finally address in in a way that essentially makes us more competitive to attract the very very best uh, graduate students and then advising um, we need to do a better job in how it is we advise our students so a lot of those things will come up in successive um successive talks uh, from my colleagues in just a few minutes next slide please Uh, just to just want to touch really briefly on uh, first generation, uh, the, the both first generation students and first generation uh, faculty this semester. The Office of Undergraduate Education will be announcing the first cohort of first generation faculty um, or kind of development programs around that. That voice for the, that uh, first generation, that faculty members who are the first in their families um, to go to college, that voice is extraordinarily powerful. Um, for for our students because the number of first generation students is in, increasing significantly and working um, you know closely with the office of faculty affairs on that so for those of you number one who have an interest but number but but those especially that are first generation college students yourself um, and found yourself in factor roles please 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 get involved it means the world to our students and it has huge huge impact on our students next slide So uh, for those of you who uh, uh, attended the, the president's um, institute address, he talked ab about uh, some changes that he was thinking about um, in the DEI space with the uh, retirement of Archie Irvin, who's been here uh, for 13 years. Um, there was a, a look, a fresh look at our, our DEI um, efforts, kind of our success points um, and uh, pr priorities, uh, closing gaps, particularly as it relates to academic student performance and retention, graduation, um, admissions, uh, seeking to close those gaps, also to seeking to close gaps on faculty and staff retention, career progression, um, equity, um, that has led to um, some changes uh, in the organization that will embed uh, the, the existing programs across academic and administrative uh, units rather than being run out of a central separate office. Um, the, uh, the chief diversity officer role that um, Archie Urban served will not be replaced, but it will be replaced with a diversity and inclusion strategic leadership team. It'll be a relatively uh, small group of um, mostly leaders on campus that will be responsible for setting um, and uh, holding responsible our, our goals. Our goals and values, I think you will see, have not changed. Our, our strategic plan, I think, is fairly clear on what our, our values are, what our ambitions are, and that will become the purview of this small group that will be led by myself um, and a brand new uh, Dr. Shante Bolton. She's our new executive vice president for administration and finance. That is um, that structure is being um, finalized as we speak. Um, I think you'll be hearing hearing more about that. We have a kind of a multi-phase um, approach um, to uh, to these changes that will un continue to unfold over the fall. We are kind of just finishing, just coming close to finishing the second phase on. Um, you know, where the, the existing um, activities will land elsewhere on campus. I think there's a couple of principles. I don't think you're going to see really any changes in the kinds of work that is being done by that office. It will just be done on different parts of the institution and, and frankly, in some cases, closer to the action of uh, faculty and students. So, for example, some of those will come into the provost office, OMED, which has been a program that's existed for decades, which was originally in the provost office. 
move to centralized DEI will now be back uh, in the provost office. We've already had some really great conversations about um, how to do some new things and um, really actually excited about that. Things like the advanced professors, uh, women in science and technology will also come into the uh, to the provost office as a, in addition to to some other folks. So um, lots of things to, to be doing there and to, to work on and to really frankly look forward to um, in closing some of the gaps that we um, talked about. Next slide, please. <coughs> so I think, again, I already touched on a whole bunch of different things. I'm going to turn it over to uh, Larry Jacobs, our Senior Vice Provost for Education and Learning, to talk about a couple of things in, in his office, again, doing a ton of things, but particularly as it relates to QEP and, and the arts. So Larry. Thanks so much, Steve, and I hope everybody can hear me. Thank you, Steve, and I hope everybody can hear me and see me wonderful okay thanks for the, this opportunity to talk to you i have a single slide if you would go to the next one please to talk about the two very exciting uh, uh, opportunities in the uh, academic space the first uh is what we're what is our quality enhancement plan uh those of you this is part of our SACS reaccreditation we're on a 10-year cycle this will be our Basically, our, our third uh, quality enhancement plan. This is an opportunity for us to look to the future, to work, spend a significant amount of time and effort in an area that we're interested in. If you look at past quality enhancement plans, it would be our Serve, Learn, Sustain was our most recent. And then the other was a combination of, of undergraduate research and um, uh, study abroad, actually the international plan, and you see those, they have all had a significant impact on our, on our campus, on the, the way we do academics on our campus. And so the QEP that we're on, the, the where we are now, we've selected a topic, it's called Leadership and Progress and Service, but the emphasis on creating transformative uh, learning experiences, looking at ways for students, we're, we're doing so many wonderful things in this space about uh, uh, high impact practice, experiential learning, and this would be a, this will be a way, an opportunity for our students to combine things, looking for ways to get credentials, looking for ways to enhance current degree programs. Uh, so it's an exciting area. We'll be working for basically the next year, coming up with a plan, developing student learning outcomes, and how we're going to do this. We are. Uh, we are in the process of hiring a director uh, for this QEP. We have down three finalists. They've gone through the interview process and we will hopefully be coming out with an announcement of who the QEP director is within the next week or so. The other exciting area is we have a, a search that is ongoing earlier in into that process for an assistant vice provost for the arts. Uh, this is very important for us from an academic perspective. Uh, we, we, we need someone who at the provost level who's going to be deliberate about opportunities on how we're going to integrate the arts into our curriculum, into our educational process. We already do some wonderful things in the arts, but nothing at, at it, let's say, at, at, at not taking advantage at the more interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary level. We're hearing this if if you look from an economic perspective, uh, the arts is about a sixty billion dollar uh, industry for Georgia. We're hearing our students want to get engaged in this space. They're looking for educational opportunities, whether it's a degree or minors. And then also the employers, people are coming to us saying, look, your students are very uh, techn technologically savvy and have great, op great uh, ideas in the arts. Let's come up, align our curriculum or develop new curriculum or new opportunities to be able to, to work for that. That is that search is chaired by uh, Dean of the Libraries, Leslie Sharp. Uh, that has been open. The, the call went out about a month ago. The closing is coming up. It's tomorrow or the next day. Uh, we're looking for someone who is very collaborative. This is open to uh, it's it's an uh, to existing faculty member uh, uh, on, and the academic faculty members looking for people who are collaborative, who are the ideal candidate would understand our academic programs and be able to work across the the institute to, in developing in, in these new academic programs. 
And that's all I have. Great, thank you, Larry. And we're gonna transition to Nelson next. Thank you, everybody, and good morning. Uh, I assume you can hear me as well, so just a thumbs up will help make sure that's happening. So thank you. Uh, as some of you may know, the three nationally and internationally recognized units, C21U, Seismic, and GTPE, have all come together to form the Division of Lifetime Learning as of July 1. This new organization stems as one of the Institute's strategic plan initiatives. Our intention is to be more strategic, thoughtful, impactful as we do our work together to improve the way people learn across their entire lifetime. And further, working with faculty governance and the university system, our goal is to become Georgia Tech's seventh college. So why a college? Next slide, please. Technology and other drivers are changing the way people learn. This is true of in-person learning as well as other delivery methods. Just think of the conversations we're all having about AI and its potential impact at this moment. These sorts of transformations are gonna continue. As a public research university, we have an obligation to expand access and help prepare all citizens for these changes. We can improve learning outcomes, for instance, for our K-12 partners and the estimated 40,000 of Georgia workers whose jobs are gonna be altered by digital transformation in the next 10 years. Georgia Tech's been a leader in the past and is well positioned to continue leading higher ed in its educational innovation needed to prepare young students, young minds for college, and once they leave, support a thriving workforce in navigating digital transformation throughout the many phases of their career. The division's broad. Currently about a thousand faculty are already working in some capacity with one of the divisions. That's most of you. We touched nearly a quarter million people last year, including 60,000 teachers and K-12 students. These learners are certainly all across Georgia, as well as in more than half the world's countries. We can improve all aspects of how people learn in the classroom, on the job, at their homes. We need to take learning to them in some capacity. A college and its faculty will help create new credit bearing programs, including interdisciplinary degrees that prepare leaders in lifetime learning fields. We're gonna increase our research as we continue to improve learning at all levels, and we're gonna keep Georgia competitive's advantage as the best place to do business by preparing its K to gray population with current and future knowledge. Next slide, please. The president challenged us to be bold and impactful at the start of that strategic planning process. This ISP is, initiative is both. The phase one workings group culminated in a report presented to the ELT that can be found on the provost website. Its main recommendation was a creation of a college focused on instruction, research, and service that helps individuals learn in the most meaningful ways across their lifetime in this constantly changing world. As I said, July 1 of this year, when the division was created, we began creating a process that would uh, work with all of you in creating design teams to help shape that future organization. We're now starting a process. We're engaging more across the university on that road to becoming a college. That will include both faculty governance as well as seeking approvals from the university system. Next slide. So this last slide shows three different information session dates. All three will be the same. I'm sure you're curious to learn more and likely have questions. We need to hear from you too, for this is Georgia Tech's initiative. So come to one of these sessions, be part of it. It's with you that Georgia Tech can and reach these aspirations. Thank you so much. Great, thank you, Nelson. Um, I just wanna give a few faculty updates as we're uh, moving forward. Um, and, and I'm sure um, it'll, we're going to settle on this slide. We'll have a, a, a bunch of different topics. You know, uh, recently you may have seen um, the results of our tenure and promotion processes for last year. Um, we were so excited to be able to promote and tenure 260 of our academic and research faculty. Of those 260, 36 were full professor, 37 faculty were awarded tenure, and then 43 academic and research faculty who are non-tenure track were promoted to their highest rank of, of principal. Um, the work of our tenure and promotion committee across campus is incredibly important and and I personally want to thank them uh, for the work that they did last year and the work that they're already doing uh, for this year. 
Steve had mentioned um, enrollment growth and specifically talked about the net new growth of our faculty. Um, you know, over the last three years, the hiring of our faculty has increased almost 20%. Um, that tenure track faculty are up over 40%. Um, but to accommodate for our growth in research, we also have significant increases in our research faculty as well. Um, one of the things that we're doing within our office is really focus on uh, focusing on expanding our programming. Um, that includes um, expanding the range of professional development that we offer out of our office. There's also uh, professional development that's offered through the Center for Teaching and Learning, which is um, in Larry's shop. Um, we're, uh, we created this year a new faculty orientation for uh, research faculty in the academic units, and we're also expanding our leadership development for academic professionals, lecturers, and research faculty. Um, in terms of the, the resources that we're focusing on this year that we intend to provide to faculty um, is guidance around um, new faculty hiring policies and processes, and then also the new faculty evaluation processes and policies that are in place this year. Um, and another point that we are that are we are working with the uh, student for or center or the Office of Student and, and um, Engagement and Wellbeing is on how to strengthen freedom of expression for students in the classroom. So that'll be another another tool that we're providing to faculty. Um, in the spring, um, I did want to mention we are launching um, the coach survey um, and that's uh, the collaborative on academic careers in higher education, which is a research practice partnership at, at Harvard University, uh, really works on collecting research on the faculty experience and for over 15 years they've been conducting a faculty job satisfaction survey and we will be administering that here on campus in spring 2024. Uh, the last time we participated uh, was in spring 2017. So um, we have it's it's been uh, a while and there's been a pandemic in the middle. So we're really interested in capturing faculty sentiment on, on campus across 13 different themes, and that includes the nature of work, leadership and governance, tenure and promotion and other items. Um, but coach the the Coach survey is administered uh, nationwide. Last year, over 12,000 faculty participated. So it's a really great way to look at our, um, compare our data over time, you know, since 2017, but also compare ourselves to some self-selected peers who are participating in the survey. Um, and the outcomes are going to be very important to us. We're currently establishing a faculty advisory committee um, who will review the results and will also make those results available campus-wide. Um, and then we, they, that committee will work together on a series of recommendations to support our faculty and we'll continue to track our progress in the coming years uh, related to uh, the data and the outcomes from that survey. Um, the last thing I want to end on, I was really kind of talking about faculty recognition. I started by highlighting uh, the many faculty who were tenured and promoted last year, and there's absolutely no way to recognize all of our faculty for the work that they do in one slide, uh, but I wanted to highlight a few of our, our recognitions in 2023. Um, five of our faculty were elected as members to one of the National Academies. One uh, faculty member was elected as a member to the European Academy of Science and six, as you can see, were elevated to fellow in their professional associations. And they represent um, a lot of the many things that are happening across our, 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 our campus. Um, in the spring at the annual faculty and staff honors luncheon, we recognized over 40 faculty members for their work. Um, and that was in the classroom, in research, but also in service uh, to both their discipline and to making Georgia Tech a better place. Um, so uh, the work that they do in service on campus is incredibly important. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Carrie Davis Nozomek and Rhett Mayer to talk more about about faculty governance. Hey, good morning um, and thanks Michelle and, and thanks Steve. So uh, we'll, we'll go through fairly quickly on the faculty governance, but I, I think Michelle just said an interesting point, which is, you know, how, how do we continue to push forward as one community and, and implement things that, that are totally aligned with our values and, and make it the best place it can be for all of our faculty. So if we want to move over to the next slide, um, I want to take a little bit of time to talk through uh, what we've done in the last two years, and and it's a lot. Um, I, I don't necessarily want to go bullet by bullet, but the, in the top two there, 
Uh, maybe the first one's really important. Uh, we spent a lot of time at governance working with our community, working with the faculty, and drafting in some some new provisions on academic freedom. Um, and and those absolutely predated any of the discussions on on maybe some recent clarifications from USG. And I think what's important there is we actually provided thought leadership on that. Um, similarly, with our progressive discipline provisions, that that was us looking internally. Uh, understanding our, our our values, understanding our community, and and just putting it into statutes and bylaws, right? So the statutes and bylaws are encapsulated in the handbook, and that's that's really our guardrails. That's our values and guardrails encapsulated in and how we choose to operate uh, as as a community and and the values and aspirations that we have. Um, obviously, there were some big changes, right? I mean, we're we're totally aware of that. Uh, yet, yes, the USG made some very substantive changes to some very fundamental positions that we all understand. But uh, working with, with Steve and his team and Michelle, uh, you know, faculty governance was was very active in that. And we were able to advocate to, to create the best possible implementation of those changes. And, and yes, we, we, we totally understand that post tenure review looks a little different today, but it looks, um, it's encapsulated inside guardrails that have been put together to implement it as best as we can. I think I'll just wrap up over the last two years too, because it's the one that perhaps is is le less visible. But um, we really inject a lot in in, in governance, and I, I just really want to thank uh, the provost for that. Uh, we have weekly meetings, and and it's very very much a case of shared governance. We're engaged, um, even linking back to what Dean Baker was talking about. Nelson's talking about the launch of the new of this the the new college. And that's something that we've already been engaged in and are having conversations too. So. Uh, yes, we've done a lot of work in the last two years. Uh, I, I think it's set on a fundamental tenant of, of always looking for the best opportunities to shape and put in place things that promote exactly the type of community we want to be. Um, and so I'm going to kind of close it there and, and hand over to Kerry to talk about what we're moving forward into uh, as we as we push ahead. Thanks, Rhett. Can we have the next slide, please? Uh, so Rhett has sort of given a, 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 a a rundown of what we've addressed the last two years, but we wanted to uh, plant some seeds on what we think is coming down the pipeline. Um, in in terms of additional drafting and ways to essentially govern ourselves, there are some forthcoming proposals. Uh, right now, uh, faculty governance has been working on, for quite some time, uh, proposals on research misconduct and uh, faculty uh, Title IX provisions. With, these are provisions that essentially tell us how we're going to handle allegations of faculty misconduct, whether they are research related or sexual in nature. Um, we have the right as faculty um, to govern ourselves, but it's incumbent on that we set a process that, that honors our values, but holds, holds each other accountable. In addition to that, um, we have been thinking in a uh, broadly in faculty governance about what can assist faculty and would improve the day-to-day -day lives of faculty. Um, and so far, we've landed on two pieces. Um, one is to continue to push the administration to help us provide training, support, and coaching for everybody who evaluates uh, faculty. Partic it's particularly important now that there will be mandatory meetings between supervisors and faculty, um, and that we have an entirely new um, evaluation process. The other uh, has come up more recently, um, periodically we as faculty um, reevaluate how we evaluate teaching, um, but we've been leaning on COs pretty heavily and for quite some time. Yet lots of members of our community are very skeptical, and rightly so, of our use of COs. So rethinking how we evaluate teaching effectiveness and the sort of right sizing the instrument that COs is. I think is important for us for faculty governance. Um, lastly, pushing on what Rhett suggested that we are providing um, accountability and input weekly. I suspect if we're all reading the tea leaves nationally, right, issues of academic freedom and freedom of expression and issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion hit the national news and academic news. And, and it's critical that faculty continue to provide input and accountability for the issues that develop on campus. Um, but we can't do it without you. 
please consider getting involved uh, in faculty governance and sharing your voice. Uh, all of our meetings are open to everybody, uh, every member of the community, um, but they, we also have elections coming up. This month, we'll, the unit should be running um, elections for the representatives for the, the research and academic senate. And in the spring, in April, we run elections for all of the committee, which are the workhorses, the committees who are the workhorses for faculty governance and our executive board. So please stay tuned uh, for impending announcements for elections. We appreciate you. Great. Thank you, Harry. Thank you, Rhett. And thank you to all of our presenters that we've had up so far. Um, so as I mentioned at the onset, we are going to do a Q&A segment. Um, as a reminder, there is a Q&A feature. If you can send your questions in to us, um, we are ready. We got a couple in advance, um, but we are ready for more and we definitely have time for it. So please do use that Q&A to send in your questions. Um, before I get to our first question today, I did want to turn it back to Provost McLaughlin and just see if, uh, Steve, if you had any kind of closing thoughts or any uh, recap remarks from what we just heard before we go to the questions. Sure, ab absolutely, I, I do. In fact, I might have more than than less uh, because uh, yeah, already, um, you know, just a number of things have have come to mind. Some of which I think are, are are obvious. But let me step back just a little bit and pick up where where Carrie left off um, around the involvement of faculty governance. And it really is begging people, please, please, please get involved. I think we are entering a new era um, of faculty governance, and I think that that has shown up in a bunch of different ways. It showed up with post tenure review. It showed up with um, it showed up in the in the pandemic. Um, as Rhett pointed out, um, uh, we did work together in, in terms of freedom of expression and academic freedom that has paid off um, in this in this challenging moment. We have very, very regular as Rhett pointed out. We have very, very regular candid conver conversations and have really never, ever worked uh, better together. So I have a huge, huge thanks to Rhett and Carrie uh, for that for that partnership. Um, and really, please, please get involved. You you absolutely have a voice. You can absolutely make changes. Some of the for so for example, some of the changes, organizational changes that have taken place um, in DEI, um, faculty governance had a direct voice um, in in those, and, I, and will continue to have that that voice. So so please. Please do get involved. Um, one of the things that I think um, you may have hear me say is kind of tend to the obvious, and I think there's some obvious things that haven't yet addressed um, here that I that I certainly intended to and and want to do right now. There's a lot happening um, in in the world um, uh, today. Let me just kind of go back to uh, affirmative action and the Supreme Court Supreme Court decision and just say a little bit about that. Uh, about what it is we're doing, you know, that the, first of all, race and ethnicity were never a determining factor in admissions um, at Georgia Tech, but our, our the application we had before did have um, the ability for uh, applicants um, to disclose uh, racial, uh, racial um, and ethnic information as part of, uh, you know, several factors that was part of the holistic um, evaluation. We have removed that option in compliance with uh, the courts ruling and we're going to continue to do the work to remove barriers and um, stay true to our goals that we've uh, communicated in the strategic plan. It's not just for undergraduate <clears throat> admissions, it's also graduate admissions. Um, and I think for the fa for faculty here, we know that that admissions on the graduate side is done locally. Um, at the college in, in Bonnie Ferry has done uh, fantastic work in working um, with the individual colleges and units to make sure um, that admissions that's being done um, locally for, for graduate uh, programs is done in conformance with, with the court's ruling. Um, also, uh, you know that um, the, some of the uh, recent USG University System of Georgia Board of Regents policies, um, in, in particular in, in HR, um, um, have changed how it is we do, say, faculty recruiting um, and job applicants. We many, many units used to have uh, DEI statements as part of their uh, you know, faculty recruitment, kind of assessing folks' interests in that space. Those are no longer allowed. Um, Michelle um, has been working closely with HR to, again to kind of to communicate to the colleges and schools as you go out to, to, to emphasize our strategic plan. And there are ways 
um, for us to not give up on our goals, not give up on our values, uh, because we can't do DEI statements, but to, to invite um, to invite applicants to to talk about our values and to talk about the things that that are important. I'm absolutely convinced that we can achieve everything that we set out to achieve in in the strategic plan in light of you know factors really outside of our 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 control of things that we're that we're required to do. I think the last thing I want to I want to touch on is obviously you know the the anguish that we're all feeling. Um, around the continued war in Israel and Gaza. Um, you know, in a, in a diverse community like ours, um, each of us experiences these events um, in, in different ways. But really now more than ever, we have to be uh, committed to constructive dialogue, to mutual respect, care and compassion for, for one another, for our students, for our faculty and, and staff. So many people are directly affected by what's happening um, in the region today. Um, and you know, every member of our community has the right to speak freely um, and to expect respectful interaction and discourse. Uh, those are the expectations of, of our, our community. We, we have had some incidents of both um, personal and um, uh, on, on individual people and property, and those are all being, uh, all being uh, addressed um, really daily. Um, and so we really do have the right, again, to, to, to speak freely, uh, but, but to be respectful and, and just most of all show incredible care for um, each other in this really, really, really challenging um, moments. I already saw there's a, a question there around uh, anti-Semitism. Of course, anti-Semitism is not tolerated on, on our campus um, and in line with the things that, that I shared. Um, we expect our community um, to hold each other to um, to those values that that those are those are not acceptable on 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 our campus as well as many other kinds of um, um, speech or threats or, or uh, we can we can have conversations in a really uh, careful and uh, respectful way. Most importantly, so that our students feel safe. Our community feels safe, and if if um, if you see things, if you experience things, absolutely do not hesitate to reach out to me, to the police. Um, if there's anything that my office or others can do, um, we will continue to obviously watch the situation very very closely um, and be assistance um, in the best way that we can. So with that, I think we have about 20 minutes um, of of Q and A. I don't know what kind of questions maybe um, have have queued up. I haven't really been been watching, but again, I want to really thank everyone for being here. We have almost 200 people, um, so thank you for caring. Um, thank you for uh, taking care of each other. So uh, back to you, Jason, for questions. Yes, thank you very much, Steve. And, and yes, you did address that uh, first question that came through about anti-Semitism here on campus. And while you were speaking, uh, another question came through about uh, Islamophobia here on campus. And I know that I can speak for you and everybody within the provost office uh, in saying that yes, um, on on both of those matters, it is absolutely critical um, that we be kind, we protect one another. And if there are any concerns about safety or if there are any concerns um, at all that the provost is here, the police are here, the student engagement and well-being dean of students for our students are here. Um, with that, I'm going to uh, go to our next question, which was uh, I'm going to turn this to Stephen Gerardo, please. Um, Stephen, a lot of our first year students are coming in now and are very used to technology as a primary tool in learning. Can you address what will hybrid or online learning look like going forward? Sure, thanks for the question and um, happy Halloween to everybody. Yeah, I, I, it's a great question and I, I do want to start with the premise, which is um, just acknowledging too that not all first year students or learners will come in fully comfortable with online technology for a variety of reasons, particularly as we look to expand access to Georgia Tech and we may bring in students from different backgrounds who have not been well versed in technology. That said, I do agree that overall students are coming in with more comfort and experience with online learning. Um, but we're really committed to a, a fully residential online uh, undergraduate program. And so where we're looking to do is to be able to provide you know, more flexibility with online course offerings um, in a strategic way to really help, for example, students progress um, more uh, efficiently through their degree programs, for example, take a course while they're co-oping or interning. 
um, or while they're studying abroad. Um, we also recognize that we've had some challenges around space and classroom facilities, and Steve mentioned the Provost Advisory Committee on Academic Scheduling, which is up and running. And so working in coordination with that group, which is going to really have to look carefully at um, how we schedule classes and when we schedule classes and explore some of the things that we left off doing a couple years ago before COVID um, in, cl in classroom scheduling. Um, you know, I would also just say too that it's important as we think about online courses that we want them to be high quality. And so thinking through the quality of online instruction and the preparation of faculty um, teaching, supporting faculty who are teaching online and supporting learner students who will engage in an online course. And so we're working closely, Larry and I, particularly with our new Associate Vice Provost for Transformative Teaching and Laura, uh, Teaching and Learning, Laura Carruth, who just joined us about a couple months ago from Georgia State. We're part of her portfolio there, um, included online learning. And so we're engaging her in some conversations um, about how to explore this very question. So more to come on that, and we'll appreciate the input and involvement from many uh, on this topic. Awesome. Thank you, Stephen. Our next question is going to go to Larry Jacobs. And so, Larry, um, you can come on and talk a little bit about the impact that AI will have on Georgia Tech and more than just the impact it'll have on us, but how are we actually driving the tools and experience? Well, that's a great question, Jason, and obviously a, a multifaceted one. So I'll just try to go at a, at a, at a high level. Uh, first to say uh, we have a number of experts on, on, on this campus, domain experts that are doing research in this area. And uh, the ed education is just a wonderful application for that. So we have a number of colleagues currently working, you know, tr trying different things, piloting different things within the classroom and, you know, see, you know, assessing and seeing how this is working. Overall, philosophically, we want to take advantage of this as a tool. We want to embrace it. We want to use it to uh, enhance the student experience, enhance the, the offerings that we have. We're trying to keep in front of it by forming together communities. Uh, we've had a number of, of workshops. Uh, the first one was in, in May, uh, again, run out of the Center for, Teaching, uh, Center for Teaching and Learning. I know that one was very, very well intended. And I heard, again, a colleague like Emily Weigel from Biology, she talked about how she was using uh, AI in the classroom. And, you know, I, I think we, we, we actually, had, that was an overflow crowd. I think we had over 50 people and we had lunch. And so we're continuing to do that kind of thing, tending the communities. And if you want to get more engaged, a good place to go is to go to the CTL workshop and, and the, I mean, CTL website and look for different workshops that way. I know Bonnie Ferry is very engaged in this space with the graduate students, using them as partners, using them as how we're going to use AI in research. How is this going to impact what your your PhD thesis would look like? How would you use it? And she has a, a workshop coming up or a panel discussion coming up on the 16th in uh, November 16th in this space. So there's a lot going on in this area. We have a lot of expertise and we're going to continue to hopefully push the envelope and use the uh, be world leaders in this. Thank you, Larry. Our next question is going to be for Michelle Reinhardt. So uh, Michelle, question is prior to the pandemic, GT was working towards the goal of each college identifying a second measure of teaching effectiveness. Uh, the pandemic disrupted this timeline, but the goal still remains important. What's the current thinking on a new timeline for completing this work? Yeah, thank you, Jason. Um, yeah, so as, as Jason mentioned in that question that we had started, I believe it was fall 2019, uh, working with faculty governance and, and talking about ways that colleges would have um, additional measures or better ways to evaluate teaching effective, effectiveness beyond that, that sole uh, CO score. Um, the pandemic 
um, kind of delayed our response there. And then also the, the unit level work on the evaluation rubrics for annual evaluation and post tenure review also got in the way of this. And we're we're very sensitive in, in our office to not overburdening the units, um, but we also know that this is an incredibly important issue for our faculty. So um, I believe that that this should be a, a partnership with, with faculty governance, with the, the Senate and the Feb to talk about the appropriate, what, what is the appropriate timeline and what are the ways in which we can work with the units and the colleges to establish um, uh, a multi-layered approach in evaluating teaching effectiveness. And we already know that we have some colleges on, on campus, Sciences and Ivan Allen, for instance, who already do this. And what are the ways that, that um, we can learn from them in terms of um, the, the benefits um, and also how, how we can make that workload manageable because we will be asking more work of other units. Um, one of the things that we've already done now is looking at, we've relocated the CO's table in tenure and promotion packages so that it's placed um, behind the candidate's narrative and we felt that that was important to provide, to allow the candidate's voice uh, to provide context to those scores uh, before seeing those in, in, the, in the package. Uh, but working with faculty governance, I think we'll be able to thinking about when uh, faculty members submit their materials and and thinking through that schedule so that we'll be able to move forward in the next year or two on having that in place. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, we have uh, a few more questions that we're going to get to, but I did want to take a moment and um, recognize a couple of people who are very important in pulling this together. So first I want to say thank you to uh, Kara Joy Wong and Naima Barton, who are our co-producers on this event. I also want to say thank you to Susie, Eyes, uh, Susie Ivey, Brittany Aiello, Az, and Serena Wallace from our Institute Communications team. Um, as everybody probably knows, there's a ton of work and a ton of hours that go into putting this one hour together. Uh, this team did such an excellent job and has really lent their talents to such a, a town hall event. But also they're really representative of the staff that we have across this entire institute. And really I want to say thank you to all of our staff out there who put hours and hours of work into things like this and many other things that keep this campus moving. You're entirely essential to what we do. And so thank you. Big thanks to everybody. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Nelson Baker for our next question. Nelson, could you talk more about the Division of Lifetime Learning? Will this integrate with the GT Extension Office or work with Georgia's community colleges? And is there a vision yet for how we continue our mission in producing bachelor and graduate degrees, but at the same time impact education in our communities across the state? Thank you, Jason. Thank you for the question. Uh, I think the vision is beginning to take shape, but that's where these information sessions that I talked about and the involvement of people across this university is going to be so important to help shape and refine such a vision. Georgia Tech already works with many across our state, the university system, the community colleges, and, and far beyond in trying to create pathways, but I think we can be more strategic and meaningful and how we do those kinds of activities. And it goes beyond just the pipeline in from the traditional sources. We talked uh, a little bit during this town hall uh, about those um, partnership programs, but what might happen post graduation and, and post success? How do we make sure we have those educational opportunities for our uh, citizens of this state beyond to make them a thriving member of our community? So yes, we need to be doing more strategically with creating these partnerships, we continue to learn so much from the individuals that are in all of our programs, both the at scale degree programs, the 45 years of degree uh, distance programs and our non-credit programs. We're seeing people come into them to pivot careers and to uh, prepare for a future degree. How can we purposely think about that? So I welcome the conversation. I welcome the engagement from everybody to help shape a better vision for Georgia Tech. Thanks, Nelson. All right, I'm going to bring the provost back up again. The next question, you mentioned that Institute Diversity will be moving and better connected to various academic areas around campus. Can you give an overview of areas such as OMED and CSDI and who they will report to? Sure, um, great question. Um, so in the case of, uh, of OMED, uh, that'll be re reporting through um, uh, Larry Jacobs office. Uh, 
for uh, through education and learning. As I said, that was a um, OMED used to be in the office of, of the provost and, and is now is now back in. Obviously, for, uh, for those who aren't familiar, it's really around student success programs for uh, graduate, undergraduate um, students. Um, we are finalizing the exact reporting structure, but it will certainly sit within our um, education and learning um, uh, portfolio. CSDI is again really very, very similar to that. There's a, 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 a we're talking um, about expanding our outreach efforts uh, beyond those um, that have taken taken place, particularly through through CSDI. The all the staff. Um, that are in both of those organizations are still going to be around. Um, I think you won't experience really any changes uh, what, whatsoever. I think the changes that you will see are, uh, you know, improvements um, over the, um, you know, in the in the coming years as we do as we do more and more. Um, there are other elements um, around leadership that were in centralized DEI that will be moving to um, to HR. Um, human resources, some of the planning for our, our big events that I think uh, people get to experience, those will those will continue on. I think min, most of those will be run out of the Office of, of Human Resources. And I don't think you're going to see uh, much change really at all in terms of um, in terms of what you experienced from centralized DEI um, than that you're going to see um, moving forward. I think though you will be seeing um, more specific goals, as I talked about around student retention, student uh, performance gaps, uh, graduation rates, graduation, um, uh, uh, time to graduation gaps uh, that that have been uncovered in the last last year or so. So probably more focus on on some things like that. Faculty hiring. Um, uh, we know we have so much more room uh, to grow there. Uh, I would say bringing more expertise closer uh, closer to that than we've had. Um, before. So those are, um, yeah, t touched on some things. I already talked about the advanced professors. In fact, we'll be meeting with the advanced professors uh, tomorrow. They uh, reported through Office of uh, Institute Diversity. They will now be reporting through uh, the provost office and we're going to have a conversation with them on how we might rethink and reshape um, or uh, uh, take better advantage of advanced than than we've done before title nine which is also one of the the organizations that was um activities that was inside office of centralized dei will be moving to um executive vice president for administration and finance there are a number of other kind of compliance related um activities that i think will be uh, built out informed um for for there so I think that that touched on a, a, a good chunk of those activities. Thanks, Steve. Um, we've got two more questions queued up and then it looks like we'll hit noon. So first, um, Stephen Gerardo, if I could ask you to come on and answer a question um, just about what is expected coming up with the new USG Gen Ed core policy changes. Yeah, really quickly, the University System of Georgia Board of Regents approved changes in the core curriculum at its October meeting. Um, two really key pieces of that are the creation of new USG wide learning outcomes for each of the core areas. So this is uh, just for reference, this is only on undergraduate education and, and our core curriculum or gen ed um, or about 42 hours of our all of our degree programs. So the first change is these USG wide learning outcomes. The second change is embedding what they're calling career competencies into each of the core areas. Um, and so we are working closely with the registrar's office with the IUCC, the IUCC General Education Subcommittee, um, uh, Roberta Berry in my office to um, take first steps to implementing these changes. We're expected to have some of these changes in place for spring 2024 for any class offered in the core and a full rollout of changes um, by fall 2024. So there's a lot of work on the back end um, that's playing into this. Uh, largely like not huge amount of changes in courses themselves, um, but we'll be, uh, as I said, rolling out communication and access. We already have to the deans and associate deans, um, again, where gen ed courses are offered. So this won't affect every single college, but it'll affect uh, several. <clears throat> Thank you, Stephen. So we are at about time. I'm going to turn it over to the provost for some closing remarks and um, to address some uh, final outstanding questions. Steve, can I ask you to take us away? 
Jason, and I think I think uh, those there are questions in particular, um, particularly as as relate to uh, Muslim students and faculty feeling like they've not been heard. You know that the president did meet um, with a group of students and faculty. I believe it was last week. Certainly seeking all the opportunities we can to continue those conversations with with faculty and and students. Um, so please don't hesitate to 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 reach out to us. I think the overall the overall message is really please 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 continue to take care of each other. Um, respectful dialogue, respectful um, respectful speech um, is what it is we're we're all about. You know that that's uh, one of our core our core values. Um, be safe. Um, treat each other kindly um, in this really really challenging challenging moment. Um, you saw we have things to celebrate. We have things that that we're working on and challenges that that we continue to um, to work on, um, doing our very very best. Uh, but most importantly, trying to support our faculty and students the best way that we know how. So I think with that, it's 12 o'clock uh, high, and so thank you all for being here. Um, and take care, and don't hesitate to be in touch.